Друзья, я прошу. Morning, friends. I would like to ask all of you to take the remaining seats. There is a big interest, and the topic we are discussing today, as you can see, we're quite numerous. Ross Telecom has been given it quite a lot of thought. What theme do you choose to discuss during the Gaida Forum? Looking at the last century, we saw that we used to have very flamboyant slogans like collectivization or electrification, not a step backwards, forward to take Berlin. Recently, we have had this slogan of modernization and innovation. Right now, we see on our banners the word digitalization, whereas energy efficiency has never been a slogan. And we thought it a little bit unfair because it is a very important topic. Energy consumption wise, Russia ranks third after the US and China. And as far as per GDP unit, we are also occupying a very important place. And just half an hour ago, we listened to national goals, to national projects, and ways to achieve those. And based on that, this is what we're going to focus today, together with our colleagues who've agreed to talk about this theme. I'd like to introduce them. Igor Bashmakov Center for Efficient Use of Energy. Mr. Bashmakov is a Nobel Prize winner. Anatoly Chubais, I'm going to introduce him. Nonetheless, maybe he's going to respond to questions, not just as the head of Ross Nano, but also the person who used to chair one of the largest energy companies of Russia and who's been in politics for quite some time. And our third panelist, Alexander Chuvayev, Director General of Fortum, one of the largest companies producing heat and electricity, and it has a foreign stake, and we expect two governors to join us, Andrei Nikitin, as well as Aysen Nikolaev. Leaders of the energy efficiency movement in our country, I would like to ask by to, to start asking a question that I'd like to address to you, Mr. Bashmakov. What about this slogan, energy efficiency? Why is it not on our banners? Is it because we're too rich or not too smart? Thank you very much for asking this question in such a manner. I'd like to try to give you a broader response could you put the presentation on, please? There is an article I wrote. We have wrong plans that we execute, or we are wrongly executing what we've planned. And I'd like to cover both these questions. First, whether we are executing correctly what we have planned, or more broadly, whether our plans are correct. When I talk to our leading economists, to our prominent experts, I see that they do not understand at all why they need to raise the energy efficiency. Is it just a cherry on top or something else? I didn't manage to get them to answer this question adequately. And that is why I like to dedicate a bigger part of my presentation to answering this very question. It seems simple at first sight, but it is very difficult to answer. In order to do that, I'd like to dwell a little bit on the three energy transformation laws that you can see on the screen. The first one says that the share of expenditure on energy in the GDP in any country is all but stable. 
for decades or even centuries. I'm going to illustrate that a little bit later. That is very important and that shows us how important it is to raise the energy efficiency for the sake of the GDP growth. The second law postulates that in order to raise the productivity of all factors of production, not just energy resources, but others too. We have to raise the quality of energy resources. But we, if we are to achieve that, we have to understand that higher quality energy resources cost more. And if the share of energy expenditure is stable and the fuel becomes increasingly expensive, we've got to decrease energy intensity and raise energy efficiency. That is the third law. As far as the first law is concerned, we would like to say the following. For almost all countries, depending on the quality of the statistics, the share of energy expenditure fluctuates within a very short range. And that is far less than the expenditure on labor, on material resources or capital. It stands at around 8% of GDP. But we have to understand not just how big the share is, but how volatile it is. The energy prices and the share of expenditure are very volatile. And the third, the second factor is the susceptibility, the vulnerability, the sensitivity to this volatility from the part of the economic growth. As you can see on the right graph, if energy expenditure rises by one percentage point, it'll mean minus 3% of added value and 5 to 6% of profits. And that is very important. As you can see, it's just one percentage point. And so we see these wings that prevent any economy, not just ours, from flying if the expenditure share is within a certain range until the threshold of economic availability of this resource. It doesn't hinder the economic growth, but once you are beyond this threshold, as you can see on the left upper graph, it is the OECD countries' dependence on energy expenditure. If you look at the right graph, you'll see the dependency of fuel expenditure on the, or rather, how it affects the sales of cars. And in the bottom, you can see the expenditure on metal, and all that, as you can see, it can throw the economy into the throes of recession. In other words, if the share of energy consumption, the energy expenditure is too high, it can prevent the economy from thriving. Very often there is this illusion that high energy prices lead to decreased competitiveness. But as you can see, there is a linear dependency. The countries that have uh, energy prices twice as high do not have greater expenditure on energy. Moreover, uh, you can see in this red circle the Eastern European countries that still have a very high share of energy expenditure, even though the prices are low. In Russia, 
we have a very high level of energy expenditure in our GDP, even though the prices are very low. And that is because the energy intensity is very high, and that means that we lose our competitiveness, not just in outer external markets, but also in internal ones too. So we want to raise our exports of oil and gas, but how can we do that if the energy intensity is so high within the country? Moreover, this goal is not set. As far as the second law is concerned, I'm not going to dwell on that for too long. On average, because the share of high quality energy resources is growing, the, I'm sorry, the average energy price. You can see what the, I mean by equality. A higher quality energy resources are such resources that help raise the productivity of all factors of production, not just energy resources, but also capital resources and material resources. And thanks to that, we get better energy resources, decreasing energy intensity and raising energy efficiency. And this slide shows the progress we have achieved in energy efficiency in different sectors, say, in lighting, since 1700, when tallow candles were used. As you can see, the project, the, the progress has been enormous. Now, moving on to the third law, you can see the energy intensity of the world GDP since 1800. It has decreased fourfold decreasing by 0.7% a year. And there is a reverse dependency. If GDP is not growing, then energy efficiency, energy intensity is not decreasing either. If we hadn't seen a four-fold decrease of the world GDP energy intensity, then the energy consumption right now would be four times greater than we see right now. Not 14 billion tons, but 56 billion tons. And in that case, we would have already exhausted all the known deposits of oil and gas, as well as forests. We would have destroyed all the forests on our planet, and the mortality rates due to pollution by coal would have been greater, because the air pollution would have been so much greater, and not 7.5, but 30 million people would die every year because of that. And due to the deforestation, the temperature would have already risen by 3%. In other words, energy efficiency helps us address a great number of important issues related to economic growth. But the most important thing, if we hadn't seen this progress in energy intensity, we wouldn't have seen energy, uh, the growth happen at all. The prices would have been four times greater than now, because we would have exhausted all the cheap resources, the energy expenditure would have been four times higher. We made such calculations for Sweden. They had a research on that, trying to understand what would have happened if energy intensity hadn't decreased. If it indeed had happened, then the GDP per capita would have been 25% of the one they have right now in reality. So without raising energy efficiency and decreasing energy intensity, we suffer great losses due to the environmental factor. This graph shows the environmental damage to the GDP of the 
UK, as you can see, in 1870, the peak was at 24 percent of GDP. In other words, because of inefficient use of energy, the UK didn't get 25 percent of the GDP it could have gotten. I'm going to move on to Russia right now, just in a couple of minutes. As you can see, that only if we raise energy efficiency will we be able to achieve a sustainable economic growth. There is no other way forward. We should either decrease energy intensity or raise energy efficiency if we are to achieve an economic growth. Very often we hear it say that energy intensity is inherent in the Russian economy. But the most important factor is the energy prices. Yes, climate has to be factored in and geography too, but prices are the main factor. And yet another thing, in the 19th century, Russia was the most energy efficient country. The Russian oven has an efficiency of 33 percent, which is far greater than that of a fireplace or a team train. But it is no longer the case. Right now, we rank 166 out of 192 countries in terms of energy intensity. I'm not going to dwell on that either. And what is happening? Over the recent years, we haven't seen any decreases in the energy intensity, and that is why our GDP is not growing. We do not see any restructuring in our economy. And we see no growth exactly due to that. And if we try to move forward, shackled, by high energy intensity, that is what is awaiting us. On the left, you can see the GDP of key players in 2015, and you can see what is going to happen to us if this trend continues by 2050. We'll turn into a Lilliput in the country of Gulliver's. But I believe that we should not lag behind. We have to catch up with the leaders. But if we are still fettered and manacled by high energy intensity, we are not going to be able to do that. Yes, we tried to catch up in the past. You can see on the graph in yellow natural factors. But the red field is objective, uh, subjective factors that can be addressed. Yes, we did try to increase our energy efficiency, but after that, this project was abandoned by the government. And if we compare it to 2008, you can see that in 2017, energy efficiency was at the same level as in 2008. So no progress. We want to grow as fast as the world economy. And then, but by 2050, the world economy has to increase by two, 2.5 times. If we want to do the same, we have to double our economy. The thing is, we consume half of resources, energy resources that we produce. And if we double all the other sectors, then we'll consume everything that we produce, and we're not going to be able to export anything, but we'll have to consume it all on our own. So. 
the only thing we can do to double the economy, to make it grow, is to build a green economy. And we have to green the old sectors too. We have to become energy efficiency. This is the only path forward. I've been talking about very important things, but I'd like to conclude saying something obvious to everyone. There is a project to raise the energy efficiency in uh, residential buildings. A small budget was allocated. As you can see, the economies were at 16 percent. So if we do something, we achieve something. If we do nothing, then nothing will come out of it. So I'd like to say that Russia simply cannot stand aside looking at everyone else moving forward. We shouldn't lag behind. We should catch up with the rest of them. Thank you very much. As a Nobel Prize winner, Mr. Bashmakov, you, like a laser, went straight to the heart of the issue. Right now, since there are no other public officials, we're going to talk to Anatoly Borisovich. When preparing for this session, I looked at the goals set forth by the government over the recent years. These goals turn out to have been quite ambitious. Under President Medvedev, he had a decrease saying that by 2020, we had to decrease the energy intensity by 40%. This year, the government, under the leadership of Prime Minister Medvedev, has taken stock of what has been done. Since 2008, we have seen only a 13 percent improvement. The government has taken yet another package of measures. The goal right now is not that ambitious. By 2025, we need to decrease this energy intensity by another 12 percent. Alexei has mentioned that these goals are set, but they're not overseen, nor do we discuss why we fail to achieve these goals. I believe, in the context of the main theme we had during the panel discussion, whether we can secure a 2 percent growth of our economy thanks to labor productivity, well, in the context of that discussion, energy efficiency was cited as yet another important factor. But we have no national project on energy efficiency in Russia, nor do we have a special vice prime minister that would be responsible for this goal. We have the energy ministry, the um, utilities ministry that are responsible for these matters. Anitali Borisovic, what do you think? Why is it lacking this special emphasis on energy efficiency? What do you think the government should do in order to raise the energy efficiency as the most important instrument for securing the economic growth. Thank you. Indeed, while answering, I should start from the outset. I want to echo what Mr. Boshmakov has just said. As of today, Russia is one of the most energy intensive countries in the world. Back in the past, we used to be energy efficient, one of the most energy efficient countries in the 19th century. So we were in the lead, and now we are in the tail, we lag behind, we are laggards. In the past, we had a low on energy efficiency, and we had a decent pace of improving. It was so less because we reduced our energy consumption, but more because we had uh, slow economic growth. So, starting with 2013, we haven't seen any growth in energy efficiency. We have been stagnating. So, if we put these two pictures together, it, it means that we are a one of the laggards globally in terms of energy efficiency. B, the world becomes more energy efficient, we remain unchanged. And you, you can fancy that uh, it is not too bright a situation. What is to be done? Mm. 
there are two groups of solutions that can turn the tide. Both are quite painful. And the government would not be ready to take any of these, either of these groups of decisions. This is why we go around in circles and beat about the bush. Let me cite the uh, power sector, power generation sector that is close to me. Uh, the power is one of the main pillars of energy efficiency. Today the price and the tariff of the power in the Russian Federation is two times as low as the global average. Well, there are some differences from the for, for, for the uh, individual consumers and industries, but anyway, by and large, it's two times as cheap as elsewhere because of the devaluation of the ruble and the anti-popular reform of the power sector and the reduction in pr that resulted in the reduction in price. And we end up in a situation that Mr. Bashmakov has just quoted. It's cheap, no need to economize. Well, we received it as a windfall, and the wind tossed it off. And we cannot do anything about that. We cannot deprive employees of their bonuses or do anything else. And the low power price equals excessive energy spending, energy splurging. So the cheaper, the splurger. Do we have to raise the power tariff? The question is. The answer should be kind of well thought over. Because there are pros and cons. This is a poor country. The bulk of the population here are poor or very poor. Like, all of a sudden, raise it, the tariff would not be a proper thing to do. What, what would be the proper thing to do? So the rich should pay more, and the, the, the poor should stay at the same level of tariff. Which is the call, the strategy that was obvious ten years ago, and the government approached it several times, looked at it, contemplated that, but you no, know, stepped back. But now it seems the social consumption norm, or the social consumption rationing, is something that is now mooted actively. It's, if, it, if the consumption is less than 300 kilowatts per month, it is okay. the tariff is flat. If it is in excess and the rich have the consumption in excess, you'll have to pay more. If we want to m remain a super cheap country in terms of power, the cost of power, will keep being one of the most energy intensive countries. We should not spree and splurge power. Shouldn't spree electricity. Shouldn't waste it for good. Another approach to raise energy efficiency is also anything but painless. It's also painful. Prohibitions called direct, straightforward, legal bans. Well, I, I'll cite an example. Just the energy efficiency law is called it, but it had one very good provision: prohibition of the. filament bulbs, which is a good thing, 
and today the, the 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 lightning devices are mostly on the LED and they the life cycle is 50,000 hours instead of 10,000 hours LED and by the way Ranipa hasn't been using LED lightning unfortunately so um, LED is real contemporary life life it is the state-of-the-art technology and the filament bulbs are something that is absolutely obsolete. They should be banned. We should have, banned, have straightforward bans. It works fine in this country. Just ban, ban, ban. I can cite dozens of such cases. Today we produce Penacetal, one of the most um, one of, the, one of the best heat insulation materials and it's, it's produced as a result of recycling of uh, broken glass and we get this panosetal material but instead kyramzine is used Prohibition. Not starting from tomorrow, a gradual ban. And shouldn't be a wrist slap, a painful wrist slap. It should be a step by step prohibition. And a gradual rise in tariffs. So you either to get things off, to get things moving and uh, get rid of the vicinity of Zambia in the ranking. We either should introduce higher tariffs or prohibitions. The government has the, the, the toolkit. I wish it could start acting. Cross subsidies for legal and uh, natural persons, and given the high profitability of pro extractive industries. Is it possible? Okay, let me cite once again uh, the power sector. Power sector is our industry's champion in terms of cross subsidies, the additional payments from the industry paid by the industry. In 08 was 150 billion. Today it exceeds four or even approaches 500 billion rubles. So it is a tilt, a distortion of economic development. It keeps growing, it keeps destroying the structure of incentives to, 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 to save power. And definitely. You have a compet. There is a probably option of the wooden, of the firewood, for heating. What has changed in the power sector, and what has? Uh, what measures have been taken, what policies uh, have been put in place. And can you advise? As a surgeon I know said, he said, you know, it's uh, anyway, it's the client's material, not mine. With respect, with, with, uh, respect to the stoves, Wood, wood stoves, they may have another embodiment today. For example, Fortum has been using biomass. Outside Russia, Fortum hasn't been using organic fuel hydrocarbons. It's I either biomass or nuclear or hydro. So biofuel burnt in furnaces is a renewable resource, adding up the energy efficiency around 35 percent. 
Mr. Chubais has put it right, saying that our electricity tariff is quite low. It's 2.5 times lower than in Germany. If we look at the PPP reckoning here, the, pack, the picture wouldn't be that bright and Russia ranks second after Germany, ahead of UK and other Western countries. That means that exporting industries feel quite well and those domestic market-centered industries and we want good products at domestic markets, don't we? So these industries see the high power tariff weighing on them. So what Mr. Chubais has mentioned has a direct bearing here. Those industries that export and use the weaker ruble should definitely be willing to share with those dispossessed or in, a, in worse economic conditions because part of our people now are approaching the limit of their ability to pay. Another example of the site, we have updated our statistics. The previous update was 10 years ago and it turned out that it remains more or less the same. Like Finnish climate conditions are close to where we are present here in Russia, like Antimansisk, Tumen and others. The tariff in Finland is three times lower, it's three times higher, pardon me, than in uh, northern cities of Russia. But the Actual pay is even lower than here, than this country, although their incomes are much greater, their living standards are higher. So energy efficiency and stability go hand in hand, energy efficiency and prosperity. Being a surgeon practitioner, I want also to emphasize that energy efficiency is a major goal. of the national scale and government should pay heed to energy efficiency as it's going to cascade down onto other industries and have impact on these. Like the thermal power is regulated via the cost plus model. You know, businessmen are want to earn money. They're greedy. So they want to blow tariffs. But at the same time, the statistics shows that the fuel efficiency here is low. With uh, like s some of the businessmen here in this country wishing to earn uh, heat and power supply market have to find other means and ways to earn by passing and avoiding taxes. And we should think of regulation here. I'll keep thanking Mr. Chubais because the regulation put in place by his team, I mean the power supply contracts, made compelled business to become more efficient, energy efficient. The more efficient you are, the greater profits you have, and your inefficient competitors would pay to you. So he'll have different options of regulation, but there is the counter pressure at the same time from those who have intransparent earning schemes. 
So we should have, we should finally launch the reference regulation pilot project and the uh, pilot project of the perfect boiler in place. And the businessman should be able to receive profits without detriment, without damage and prejudice to their economic interests. This is my surgeon's perspective. Several words in my capacity as head of Ross Telecom. Few people know that Ross Telecom is one of the major investors in energy efficiency technologies. We have several hundred uh, different contracts to modernize lightning systems of ours to raise energy efficiency and reduce energy consumption in the public sector. Strange it might seem, we also modernize boilers with the help of the digital technology. But I can tell you from my own experience that with the highest tariff, the result is the best. Because uh, if you deploy state of the art technology against the backdrop of the high tariff, the outcome would be quite tangible. With low tariff sub subsidies are required for these pilot projects. So, in order to be able to move quickly and swiftly, you have to have the high tariffs. But with respect to the renewable energy, Mr. Chubais, Ross Nano of late has been investing in this field, you believe that this sector is promising. Well, to what extent the governmental support and subsidies are an incentive for you and others? Whether, whether it incentivizes you to increase the share of renewables, you know, I just scolded our government and for energy efficiency, but in response to your question, I must be impartial in saying that the renewable has turned a unique and colossal technology cluster. I'll say a few words on that. And it has become important for the government. And it has been advancing because the government a, has been incrementally building a system of incentives and support. Probably I have, uh, I have prepared a few slides and probably they would be uploaded now. All the renewable energy in Russia is a fruit of the colossal success by the government. Professional action by the government has received the business. Consistent action by the government has received the, the positive feedback from the business community. A uh, few people know about that, uh, so I prepared a few slides. And for, in 06, 45 countries provided the governmental backing systems for the renewables. Now in 2018, 170 countries, which mean, which means the, the the whole world. So the world is here. All the world has been championing for the energy efficiency. And thank goodness our country is also in this trend, although there are some skepticists saying, well, worldwide, probably people do support energy efficiency, but uh, renewables. But why, why support renewables here? We have a cold climate in this country, but this is a misstatement. Insulation cell radiation data, actual data. In most Russian cities, the cell radiation is higher than in European uh, cities like Chelyabinsk outperforms Berlin. Why so? Because ours is a country with a continental climate, with low humidity, with uh, low with little with few clouds and high insulation so russia is a
cold country, but not a dark country. These are two different things. Ours is not a dark country, although a cold one. Well, there are some professionals here that know that a solar panel reduces the efficiency the, at low temperatures. The lower the temperature, the higher is the efficiency of the solar panels. But you know, the opinion of those experts and the professional opinion was neglected. Well, Russia is a very good region for, for sun and solar panels. With respect to the wind, uh, even skepticists keep silent here. Our country is number one in terms of wind potential. It's simple, it's straightforward. A big country, vast dimensions, neither Germany nor Austria or Hungary or the Netherlands cannot compete with us. You can travel abroad and you can see the wind pa the, 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 the wind farms over there. But what about this country? We will keep squishing our own belly and doing nothing sitting in our hands. But we started making a change in 07 when the power reform, power sector reform was launched, thank you for praising us. We faced a fundamental dilemma. It was obvious back then but that we should pursue renewable energy back then. We were convinced, although it, it sounded bizarre and fictitious at that time, we wanted a source of governmental support. At the end of the day, it's going to be laid on the shoulders of the consumers, but you know, for us it meant either subsidies from the budget or the wholesale market. And for us it was a very hard choice. Theoretically, we would be better off with the budget subsidies. We know how budget is distributed and appropriated. Like it's lobbyism. If you don't have a renewable sector, you don't have any lobby. With wholesale uh, sector, we did have enterprises. We did have uh, presence, and hence we had lobbyism in favor of our initiatives. So then 10 years transpired and passed. We enacted hundreds of regulations, the energy ministry, economy ministry, industry ministry, enacted hundreds of laws and regulations, creating a, a good system of uh, renewable energy support. The outcome is, is this, out of a very, very, very low bar, now we're seeing, now witnessing the birth of the renewable power sector in this country. In 2015, we, we commissioned the first solar power plant, and now we have 600 megawatts of actual generation. And then we'll have the, the 1.5 to 2 times growth rates, 20, 13, 40 percent per annum the projected rates are. The skepticists may dispute and contend that, but we know the sector quite well and the government's plans to come up with renewable cluster, energy cluster with the total installed power of five something thousand megawatts will have solar generation, wind generation in 2024 with more, with aggregate volume of a generation of more than 5.5 thousand megawatts. And the technology transition is unique. In this slide, I tried to demonstrate the following. The, the bars stand for power offtake for, uh, as per the power supply contracts and solar 
energy and wind energy and uh, waste, solid waste processing also have that. Then comes power plant construction. After all the bids played, we have had the first solar power plant and the wind power plant with Russian proprietary equipment in place. We have commissioned those. We have commissioned uh, factories to produce equipment, Russian equipment. They are operational. They turn out machines. Then comes the third stage. Well, uh, probably uh, first should come the construction of power plants, and then we start constructing work, uh, works and factories with wind, with uh, solar power. We have had a, a factory for three years, and uh, wind power. Us commissioned a plant last year, but we're not the only player at the market. Then comes upgrade of. Uh, industrial scale technology. What means upgrading the industrial scale technology? Like, let's take the solar panels. Four years ago, we commissioned a plant in Chuvashia, Hevel, solar panel, a solar panel plant. We just transferred 100% of Swiss technology. We borrowed that, and the efficiency was 9%. Efficiency of panels was 9% only, but we started investing into R&D. We uh, founded uh, a Russian R&D center in Fistech in St. Pete with Russian proprietary technology. And starting from last year, we launched the production of a brand new panel, we, which is Russian solar panel with the efficiency of 22%, which is on top three solar panels worldwide. So in the final stage, would be exporting equipment technology. Hivil last year demonstrated considerable volumes of exports, and uh, we have been quite successful in this. It, it is the case for the solar power. We are in the middle of our journey with the wind and with solid waste processing. We're at the start, at the outset of our journey at this point of time. and. The first two plants are now being built in the Moscow region. That's what renewable energy in Russia is. It has been established in Russia thanks to very successful and professional work of the government. It'll generate up to one trillion rubles of investment a year. As we can see, investors are coming in droves into this sector, and they are envious and jealous of those who are the first to come, calling them names. Well, quite naturally so. The thing is, the investment has already come, and more will flow. And that accounts for 0.5 percent of GDP per year, which is quite significant. I think by the end of this year, we would like to see a growth of 1.8 percent, whereas just this one cluster, one industry, an innovation-based one, is going to generate 0.5 percent of the GDP. As far as energy efficiency is concerned, if we compare traditional energy sectors and renewable energy, we'll see that it's not to the benefit of traditional energy. Traditional energy is very energy intensive. It has a lot of equipment, whereas renewable energy doesn't need all that. It is very energy efficient. The costs, well, they're very low and it helps change the very structure of our economy. And it makes a contribution not just to the economic goals, but also to the environmental issues, too. We have to help advance the Paris Agreement. 
and energy efficiency is growing hand in hand with that. So we see some very good positive results. Igor Alexeyevich, I've got a question I'd like to address to you. Yes, we're advancing quite rapidly. And yet, so far, Russia is not among the leaders as far as its energy mix is concerned. So what do you think? What share in its energy mix should Russia pursue for renewable energy in the midterm to long term? It's very important to point out such a thing as the curve of learning. Yes, at first, new technologies are quite expensive, but as they are implemented and introduced, they become cheaper. Just recently, I read a book of 1953. An American specialist wrote it on wind turbines, and uh, he wrote that the Soviet Union had taken a decision to install some wind farms. Unfortunately, not all of them had been installed. Back then, the US, the, the, the US was envious of the USSR. The Soviet Union was ahead. Since those times, these technologies have become a lot cheaper, but we don't use them even when their efficiency is just fantastic. Two years ago, we ran pilot projects in uh, five settlements in Yakutia and in Kalima. And these settlements, energy costs 50 to 80 rubles per kilowatt hour. And the Inefficiency is enormous, and I'd like to emphasize when we talk about renewable energy sources and energy efficiency, we have to remember that these two things go hand in hand. They are closely intertwined and connected. And to our great surprise, we analyzed what lighting devices people bought in these settlements. And most of them were old lamps with 90 watt power. Even though energy efficient lamps have been subsidized by the government. And it turns out that the less efficient a household is in managing its electricity consumption, the more subsidies it has to get from the government. So a lot has been and should be done to raise the efficiency of heat, of electricity, of lighting. And in those settlements, these systems are inefficient. And if we do everything together, it brings down the utility fees twofold at least. The first project just like that was run in 2000. Uh, in one of these settlements, even though the population had been uh, greater than it is now. Had anything changed over the 17 years? No, nothing. When we came in 2017 to these settlements, the same thing we saw. In other words, nothing had been done. And the mentality is frozen. It is not changing at all. Even though there were wonderful projects of wind farms and other hybrid electricity generation plans for Yakutia and for other regions, all of this has been considered right now. But I'm afraid that all of this is going to die out sooner or later. As far as the share of renewable energy in the Russian energy mix is concerned, I can say that several years ago we calculated different scenarios for other countries. By 2050, the share of renewables is going to stand at around 40 percent in those countries. In other words, renewables 
as the largest avenue for investment, because most investment comes into renewables, not into traditional energy sources. It is a huge market, trillions of dollars worth on an annual basis, and we have barely touched it. It's not a question of whether we are going to implement at home. The question is what we're going to export once oil and gas run out. If we do not hit these markets, well, these markets are huge, as I've said. And in order to export anything for these markets, we've got to do the same at our country, at home. And we have to spread these technologies. Anatoly Borisovic has uh, said something about the measures implemented to help our industries. Yes, that's true. But there is another instrument mentioned that is co-funding, something Sobyanin has discussed today. So you give one ruble from the budget and attract another three, four, five rubles from private sources. That is exactly how energy efficiency increase is funded by in other countries. Even in supermarket economies, the government comes to aid, to lend a helping hand to raise energy efficiency. It can be uh, 6, 10 percent in electricity generation, 25 percent in utilities. So sometimes if it is profitable, you can use just the market mechanisms, but if it is a new industry we are talking about, then we have to support it. And the last thing I wanted to say, if tariff has a component for the construction of nuclear plants, no one is against that. The question is why? Anatoly Borisovic, what should the share of renewables be in the energy mix of Russia? I'm willing to answer your question, but before, if you don't mind, I'd like to comment a little bit on what Mr. Bashmakov has said. You spoke about isolated settlements and renewables, but it's a little bit different than that. We have an association of renewables, and there are three markets for renewables. The first one is the wholesale market, something I have been talking about before. The second market is isolated energy zones, and third, microgeneration. And these three markets are separate. Each and every market requires a separate set of measures of support and technological solutions. The very gist of our strategy is as follows. From the outset, we understood that if we wanted not just to build an energy, but an industry, and a science, and education, then we were supposed to start with the market that was the biggest one for the country with the most visible result. That was the wholesale market. For 10 years, we have been working on that. And we did manage to build a wholesale market for renewables. It brought about an industry, a science. Right now, we've got tens of uh, departments at Russian universities on renewables. The second market is isolated energy zones. We need another set of measures to support that, and you cannot achieve results because tariffs are not relevant and diesel is being stolen. But we understand what we need to do to achieve just that. We talked about that with uh, Vice Prime Minister Trutnev uh, with regard to the Russian Far East. I I'm confident that we will be able to achieve a breakthrough. We have uh, diesel stations built in Buryatia and Chita and another one. So the 
task that you are speaking about is the right one. That is the second market we have to have in mind to pursue. And the third market is micro-generation. Just recently, new adjustments have been introduced. Uh, a new category has been introduced, the 15 megawatt, and we're going to work on a list of measures to support microgeneration and on its development. This is the direction that we are moving towards. Now, as far as the uh, energy mix and share of renewables are concerned, by 2024, the uh, share of renewables in energy mix is going to be uh, not 0.5 percent. So there is a place to grow. There is room to grow, right? Yes, indeed. The uh, bone of contention right now is something else. 2024 is uh, what we have in mind, but we have to think what is going to happen beyond that. In 2025, 2030, you know that energy is very inertia-driven. Our calculation postulates that if right now we take the wrong decision for the additional capacities, by 2024, we'll have a cluster and an industry with a very high generating capacity will have a science that upgrades technologies, will have an education system. But beyond 2024, if the error is an error is made right now all this cluster is going to slide down and it can even be disappear the minimum threshold that our country needs is 10,000 it's 1% no 10 megawatt plus 5 megawatt that means 15 megawatt oh, I'm sorry 15,000 megawatts that's 1.5 percent of the capacities scheduled by 2030. Alexander Anatolievich, Fulton is buying existing power plants so far with a small capacity of 10 megawatt or so. But in your strategy, you perceive the need for investment. What are these goals of yours based on? Are these economic fundamentals that you have in mind, or is your company, since it has European capital, simply doing that to support European values, to care for the environment? Well, I don't know why you say that we buy power plants. We are not buying anything. No, we build power plants. We win tenders. Incidentally, Ross Nano and uh, Electri Electric Energy Association are working together with us. Ross Nano is still working in education. We're working with Ross Nano. We won two tenders. The capacities that we are to build stands at 1,000. 23 megawatt. We um, commissioned the first joint uh, power plant in Ulyanovsk region of 50 megawatts. So we're not buying anything. We are building on our own. Yes, yeah, certainly European values are very dear to us, but European values do not mean that you have to work for free. So our decisions are based on economic calculations. But as Mr. Chubais has said, if an error is committed right now, then this wrong foundation for the decision will lead us astray. Right now, the strategy until 2024 is the right one and it helps the consumer. It helps nurture competition. And the price of one megawatt at tenders has dropped by 56% over 2017, 2018. 
if my memory serves me correctly. Right now, it takes around 90,000 to modernize a curl power plant, but the wind turbine only takes uh, 60,000 to modernize. Yes, sometimes wind blows, sometimes it doesn't, but still, it's quite competitive, the price I mean. And in 10 years, this competitiveness is going to become stronger. And Mr. Chubais is absolutely right. We have to support this industry right now so that it doesn't die out, so that we can preserve and expand the technologies that we are going to use once these industry hits commercial ground. Yet another example I'd like to cite with regard to the wisdom of regulation. When first tenders on solar were held, the price was 370 euro for megawatt, and the Finns told me, are you mad? The price is terrible because in the rest of the world it was 90 euros or so. But according to the regulation, there was a 50% fine on capacities for non-localized power plants. This year, we managed to use this clause and decrease the price by 50%, winning one of the tenders. That is the wisdom of regulation. This is something we have to keep in mind. And this is exactly what we're doing right now, laying the foundation for further activities. A competitive environment has been fostered, and we feel comfortable in it. And these conditions have to be preserved. There are proposals on single tariff, uh, three-prong tariff, but we already have a mechanism that helps us achieve success. Why should we try untested mechanisms when we have one that is already working? So Ross Nano and Fortum and others working in renewables are performing quite well, showing great results, and this success has to be reinforced. Uh, friends, I suggest we get back to energy efficiency. We have two directors of uh, relevant departments from construction ministry and energy development ministry in the audience. I'd like to ask you two gentlemen to come here to the podium and sit in these chairs. Maybe you could say a little bit about the measures government has taken to help regions to co-fund projects and energy services and energy efficiency, everything that seeks to raise energy efficiency, both in the budget and elsewhere. You have seven minutes each, gentlemen, because we've got 15 minutes left. Dmitry Denisov, Ministry for Economic Development of Russia. As mentioned correctly, in April last year, a comprehensive package of measures, a plan, was adopted on energy efficiency. This comprehensive plan is something we're working within the framework of. There are several events planned, around 60, mostly covering comprehensively, or almost comprehensively, the regulatory measures you have been discussing here. What am I talking about exactly? We have to conduct an analysis together with the Energy Ministry in order to understand how we can transition to another regulation paradigm and heat and el electricity generation and transportation. There are two issues. Right now, the Energy Ministry is developing new standards. We would like to regulate these uh, generating organizations. 
on new principles. The old method helps some because they have very high starting position. Right now, what we want is to introduce a system of benchmarks, the best practices, the best available solutions. This is a very complicated matter. And it's going to take not a year, but decades. And our science has been considering that for quite some time. Yes, we, we do have the technological basis, and we, we understand how, in terms of regulation, we can achieve precisely that. As for the prospects of renewables and modernization and the additional capacities allocation program, we can say that the latter has been implemented. Yes, the efficiency is still very low, but it's low across all industries from geological surveys to exploration to transportation of resources to using energy resources to produce electricity to electricity distribution. So there is an efficiency in all of the chains. And all of these components. The additional capacities allocation program has showed us that it's very efficient. No, Dmitry, I'm sorry, I'm cutting you short, but my question was different. How are you going to help Bridgens to address the issues they are faced with? Anatoly Borisovich has said that people are living in poor conditions. They do not have money available. And there are no co-funding mechanisms. So there are issues that have to be addressed. My response will follow two tracks, as we have two tracks in helping. First, we've got a joint working group with the Russian regions. At this working group, we discuss precisely that, how we should regulate and harmonize federal regulation and regional regulation so as to launch the energy efficient project in regions. It is a feedback mechanism. Right now, regions submit the proposals. We analyze them and try to integrate them into our proposals and our strategies. The second track we are pursuing and which we believe to be important consists in the following. Igor Bashmakov has aptly said that in 2014, the emphasis somewhat shifted. In what way did it shift? The energy efficiency program of the government stood at five, six billion rubles each year. But in 2014, it all but collapsed for 2019, 2020. A very small sum, all but negligible, has been allocated for energy efficiency, just 60 million rubles. And the money is aimed only at preserving the current level of energy efficiency. And there is no money available to raise it. So what we want is to resuscitate what we had before, before 2014. We have already submitted our proposals to the government. We are requesting that the old medal should be resuscitated. We want to use the old model which we, we had, the co-funding by the federal government and the regional government. Mikhail from the construction ministry. Is the ministry going to fight for such a fund? Is it going to 
advocate a better energy efficiency for our regions. If you don't mind, I'd like to say that mostly we've been talking about electricity generation, but it is in a somewhat privileged state as compared to other utilities. And there is a great investment component involved. Technologies are becoming better, and there is money. You have to understand that energy efficiency is costly. It's quite expensive. But let's look at water, for instance. 20 rubles is what a cubic meter of water costs, and this tariff is very low. It's lower than the in year in costs. There is no available money. Utilities are lagging behind electricity because the tariffs are so low. I refer both to heat and to water. There is no profit coming from these services. And a lot of money has to be funneled into all of this from the budget. This, yeah, for instance, we have unprecedented budget resources allocated for water, for heat. It will stand at 150 billion rubles from the federal budget and 50 for the cleanup of water in the Volga Basin. And some more money in the uh, utilities fund. But even this money is not enough because this money has to uh, increase the amortization base and tariffs are going to grow. And this wear and tear will have to be factored in. So old equipment will have to be uh, replaced and new equipment will have to be installed. And if we do not do that, we will have to revisit it in future. And right now, it is our chance that we've got to seize. And what our colleagues have said is true, too. In certain zones, we are not economizing. We are at a different stage. Things have been stolen. Well, no one is doing that in energy right now, electricity. But it is still happening in utilities. It is also a matter of organization. It is very important. Big energy holdings require a single policy, tariff policy, personnel policy. You cannot build a wind power plant or solar power plant if you were, you know, plain clothes don't have money to buy proper tools. So we need to to step to a new level, to raise to a new level, I'll, in a nutshell. Well, we have virtually exhausted our uh, timeline and agenda. And uh, in terms of concluding remarks, for us not to turn into dwarfs that were given in the slide of uh, Igor, we should be ready and eager to pay for the energy efficiency as consumers and taxpayers. On this positive note, I want to thank everybody, all the panelists and the participants and the listeners. Have a, a good meal. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>